So for the last year and a half or so, I've been writing a book about youth-led political change, and it's called Are We Screwed? And <laughs> days after I finished the book, Donald Trump became president, so I'm going to talk about some of the risks he poses to Canada and what we can learn from the Trump resistance. So Canada right now feels like a refuge of calm, and we basically are telling ourselves that Trump could never happen here. We're too welcoming, we're too multicultural, we're too progressive, and we're too reasonable. But these beliefs gloss over an ugly reality, and the forces that created Trump, as well as Brexit, as well as the wave of right-wing politics that are overtaking Europe, those forces also exist in Canada. And the warning signs are just about everywhere these days. The mosque shootings in Quebec City, for example, were shocking, but they were a terrible reminder of something that Muslims and other marginalized groups in Canada have known for years. Islamophobia and intolerance are quickly rising. The wildfire that burned Fort McMurray was shocking, but thousands of laid off oil workers were already in hard times before the disaster. And once the town is rebuilt, those oil workers will still be struggling. The skyrocketing house prices in Vancouver and Toronto are shocking, but the wealth divide that created them has been growing more extreme for decades, and it's growing larger every day without a clear solution in sight. So I, I think there are two ways that the Conservatives could win a Trump-style victory in the next federal election. Kelly Leach could convince working class white people across the country that they're being screwed over by immigrants and foreigners and people of color. Or if Kevin O'Leary becomes leader, he blames unions and environmentalists and urban elites and other progressives for the country's problems. And like Donald Trump, he talks and acts like a populist outsider. And the media, and trust me, I'm from the media, we cannot get enough of it. We know what's going to happen, but we print everything he says anyway. At the moment, Justin Trudeau looks relatively strong. He's charismatic, he's popular, he's got his fists up. But that, on its own, I don't think will be sufficient in 2019. His hold on power, I believe, is much more fragile than it appears. And I'll give you an example from my book. One of the main reasons that Trudeau won the 2015 election is because tons of people in their 20s came out to vote, many for the first time. And the turnout among this age group is up 18%, which was huge. But for many of the young people who voted for Trudeau, a vote was actually a vote against Stephen Harper's petrostate. So when Trudeau approved the Kinder Morgan pipeline late last year, he was effectively saying, screw you to the generation that helped get him elected. And I, I know what many of you are thinking, and I've thought it too, politics is, is full of compromise and incremental gains. Trudeau approved a pipeline, but he also brought in a national carbon price. And, and you know, that's just how our political system works. But you don't have to look too far to see the weakness of this strategy. Donald Trump gave his supporters permission to be angry and to tear the system down. Hillary Clinton, meanwhile, told hers to do a complex cost-benefit analysis. Now, there's a raging, anti-Trump resistance. It is people of, of all ages and all ethnicities. It's really exciting to watch. Uh, many of its leaders are young people, and their values are quickly becoming the mainstream. I believe that in Canada, progressive leaders should be paying close attention to what's going on in the US. The new generation of activists takes inclusion extremely seriously. And they believe that every political movement needs a critique of structural racism. And if you want to get 
young voters excited about politics, get people of color to lead political parties, get women to lead them. Many millennials also demand a critique of capitalism. Young indigenous activists, for example, are at the forefront of a campaign to divest from banks that are funding the Dakota Access Pipeline, and it's so far influenced over $4 billion worth of assets. The global divestment movement is a $5 trillion movement. And polls show a majority of young Americans distrust capitalism, and the insane house prices in cities like Vancouver are convincing many Canadians of the same. The reason Bernie Sanders got record numbers of young voters is because he demanded a new economic system. And the anger that Bernie channeled is now being expressed in grassroots protests across the US. And these protests are scaring Republicans, but they're also scaring moderate Democrats because the protests are being organized by groups outside of traditional party politics. You may have heard of one of these groups. It's called the Indivisible, and I'm not sure how this slide relates to it, but <laughs> Indivisible was started by former political staffers in their early 30s, and it urges its thousands of followers to fight any politician, right or left, that doesn't stand up for progressive ideals. And I guarantee that many Canadians my age and of all age groups feel the same. Uh, millennials in particular want leaders who transcend party politics, critique capitalism, and aggressively fight racism. And in our new political era, it's dangerous for progressives to ignore that. And this has all essentially been a pitch for my book, which comes out soon, and we should all buy it. Thank you.